Hey everybody, it's Dennis Dykin from the Smithereens, and you're listening to Waterloo Underground with my pals Johnny and Miriam. I'm loving this show till the sun shines. Hey there, Waterloo Undergrounders. You're listening to a brand new episode of Waterloo Underground with Miriam and... Johnny. Hey, today we've got a very, very special guest, none other than Basher Deluxe, Dennis Dyken, who is known to you all as the trapsman behind the great smithereens and also with the great project that he's the master of. Yes, Dennis Dyken with Bell Sound. And he's also a disc jockey. Yes, at WFMU's Rock and Soul, he's got Denny's Den going. Every week, we're going to be talking about that and a lot of other things, but mostly about how the smithereens got inspired by the kicks and other things and his own involvement with the group, which, as you may know, is closer than a lot of us have ever gotten to kingdom. So welcome, 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 Dennis Dykin. Oh, thank you so much for having me, both of you. It's, uh, it's This is right up my alley, and... Uh... And Miriam, gee whiz, we go back so long. It's it's really nice to spend a little time with you. Oh, thanks a lot. Yeah, it sure is. So, Dennis, take us back a ways. Where did you come from? What happened? How did you pick up the sticks? What was your first experience with the kinks? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Let's go. Well, I, I was born in North Newark or Belleville, New Jersey in 1957. Lived in the town of Garfield for a while in Bergen County till I was five. And it was during that time that I think at that age, four or five, thereabouts, actually younger, I got hooked on uh, on rock and roll and music, probably from watching American Bandstand, you know, uh, uh-huh. TV when I was a little kid, uh, especially you know, later in the afternoon. And I really think the, the twist and that whole era, I just got really immersed into, into music. And I think I was actually about two, like, yeah, when I was about two and a half or thereabouts, I got my first toy drum like an indian tom-tom for christmas wow e9 um, and i started uh picking up my tinker toys on lincoln logs and playing along uh to the music and i i just w- was really drawn to the rhythm of of music I, and and i think it was like i said the twist records and the early um 60s music i really dug the four seasons rhythm tracks and the uh Bobby Rydell records and um, and the Beach Boys and the Phil Spector stuff. But there was so, as you know, there was so much music happening back then that was a, a great uh, training ground for any uh, aspiring musician. So I think that's what did it. And I, I'll never forget in 1964, the family had moved to Carteret, New Jersey, which is where I grew up, a little further south down the coastline. And uh, Matty DeFilippis was my buddy who lived across the street from me. And he was the same age. Um, as I was, so we bonded, and his mom belonged to the Capitol Record Club. Remember the Record Club, of course, right? Sure. Where I send you some new releases, and so uh, they, between the two of us, we really started digging into music together. And his mother saw that I was playing at that time. By that time, I was playing on coffee cans with plastic lids with with my uh, Lincoln Logs, and she said. Here, she gave me a pair of toy drumsticks. I'll never forget that, bless her heart. And I still have one of those two little white wooden drumsticks. Wow. Wow. That was 64, and I didn't get my first kit till 68, but I had been practicing all that time. I was yeah. ready by the time I got that, uh, that uh, used red sparkle Ludwig drum kit in 68. And then, uh, wow, that's what I have now. <laughs> that's how I got started, you know? <laughs> Yeah. Question. You were listening to the radio, obviously. And did no. you have an, an, tell us a little bit about that. And also, did you have siblings who possibly passed on some records to you? Well, I have an older brother. It's kind of like Wally and B. We're six years apart. He's older than me. And uh, certainly, we, we grew up listening to music together. And uh, But really, I think... Although he was very astute with music, even though I was younger, I was more geeky about it. And I, I really followed the charts and had to know who the artists were. Even before I could read, I remember knowing what certain records were by uh, going to the, the record store with my parents and they would 
uh, they would read me the titles, and I, I think that actually helped me <laughs> learn how to read was by 45s, and then of course getting to know the labels. I know you could identify with, with this, Miriam, and probably. Yeah. You did. Uh, so, uh, yeah, having an older brother was a great, uh, a great growing experience, and we shared a lot. But I, I really dove at first into it, and I, and the first singles I had that I remember having were late 62, Return to Sender by Elvis Presley uh, and Wiggle Wobble by Les Cooper and the Soul Rockers. Wow. Remember that record? It was yeah. a, a big hit, but it was like a sax instrumental. Yeah. And, and back then too, you know, rock and roll records were uh, heavily played on uh, a lot of TV shows. Like uh, if you're in the New York area, you would know Wonderama with Sonny Fox and uh, Sandy Becker, they would play rock and roll records when they did their puppets or skits or, or, or the, so all the, I, I just, the reason I flash on that is because I remember they would play Wiggle Wobble. Uh, but yeah, I, I just have such uh, uh, fond memories of, and I'm sure as we all did, bringing those 45s home, I just had a little player and putting them on, putting the records on, reading every morsel you could on the labels, right? and. Uh, Trying to figure out what is what's what is BMI and ASCAP? What's what is a, a producer? What yeah. why, why different labels, right? I mean, so and just watching those 45s go round and round and round. What about radio? What was your station and who were the jocks that you were listening to? Well, we gravitated towards WABC AM. We did listen to WMCA quite a bit. Uh, and I have vague memories of listening to WINS when Murray the K was still on. Matter of fact, I remember when he uh, premiered, uh, I think it was Monster Holiday by uh, Bobby Boris Pickett. It was a big event because we knew the Monster Mash, but he said, I was a new one coming out by Bobby Pickett and uh, we're going to premiere around this night. And so WINS a little bit. Uh, WABC, Dan Ingram will always be the king of radio to me. Uh, Dan Ingram, Cousin Brucey, Ron Lundy, um, Jack Spector on WMCA. Uh, uh, those are the guys that I remember the most. Um, I know there's a few others that it'll probably come to me as we talk. But uh, Dan Ingram to me was, uh, still is, a, a, I, I listen to his air checks a lot because he's, I think he had the quickest wit and just made listening to radio so much fun. And of course, Scott Muni too, who later became, uh, we became pretty well acquainted with when he was playing our records on, w, when Smithereens records on WNEW, I bet. Um, but uh, those are the ones that, oh, Harry Harrison, there, there's, a, there's a lot. Hearing all of these legendary New York disc jockeys names, it's, it's like a, uh, it's come to find of a mythic listing of all these gods, you mm -hmm. know, I've heard them for so many years. I wasn't a person who grew up in the New York area. So it's great to hear this stuff from someone like you who had your ear glued to the transistor and digging the sounds. You say the word mythical, Yeah. it really feels that way. And, yeah. and because it's a bygone era and, and so forth, but the fact that there are air checks to still uh, listen to and love, learn from, even when you listen to those old air checks, it still, even though you're hearing them, it still seems mythical. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Coming in from a cloud far away. <laughs> yeah, it seems so magical. So yeah. you became a, I, I presume, I think I'm correct in this, a um, British invasion nut when oh, yeah. the Beatles and the Stones and the Kinks came in. Can you remember what was going on in your little mind at this time? And how old were you really when the Beatles hit? And yeah. uh, and how early on did you hear the Kinks? And could you discern, I think you could, you know, with just the beat and so on, what was going on and what was different about these groups? Or did they all seem the same to you? Well, you know, I think about that a lot. <laughs> Even in 60, okay, in 64, when the British invasion happened, it really did blow the doors off, right? Because there were, we already had so many different sounds on the radio. On AM, you know, you would have, let's say, let's say in 63, you would have um, the Shirelles, then you'd have Del Shannon, and then you would have Burt Camford, right? And, and uh, I'm trying to think of a, a you know, Ned Miller with, from a Jack to a King. All this different music would be on the radio. Uh, 
and it was blowing our minds. Wild Weekend by the Rock and Rebels. It's, oh, that's great. That's great. Wow, that's weird. That sounds like adult music, but I like it. This is cool. That's it. But when, yeah, I was just turning seven in February of 64 when the Beatles hit. And um, this is my first memory of any consciousness of, of the Beatles. My brother was playing basketball in the church basketball league. I mean, on Sundays, he would go to practice or games. And I remember him coming home, I guess it might have been January of 64. And we're both into music and, and records. And he says to me, yeah, all the guys are talking about this new group. They're from England. They're called the Beatles. They spell it with an A, and you should see the way they comb their hair. <laughs> phrase we don't use anymore, how we comb our hair. But back then, it was not <laughs> comb your hair, right? Yeah. And so my interest was peaked, and I couldn't wait. And then, in short order, they were all over the radio. Even before I saw a photo of the Beatles, um, WABC started playing I Want to Hold Your Hand and Then She Loves You and From Me to You uh, and you know eventually My Bonnie and all these records were coming out at once and it was like wow and you know I looked at the charts recently and it, it really the, the invasion so to speak didn't take hold for maybe a month or two after that I was I was kind of surprised that, that before I can't really say how many weeks it was that I noticed until the Dave Clark Fives I think, actually, I think the first other British record, if I'm not mistaken, that um, that made the charts was I Won't Only Want to Be With You. I think that was pretty early 64, if I'm not mistaken. I was surprised to by Dusty. And then, then Dave Clark Five. Uh, so, but back to the Beatles for just a second. And then, so I was wildly into their sound and it was, it was really different. I don't know how else, to describe it, you know, it's, you just have to list. It's, 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 I think next to impossible to try to impart to anybody who wasn't there what a shift it was because you had to have, I think, lived it. Now it's just, it's all there at your fingertips. So you, it's kind of all blends together. But being back in that period, uh, it was a huge shift, but at the same time, it was just kind of a natural progression because as, as I said before, there was so much innovation and so much great music already on the radio. It was like, well, here's another great thing. Maybe it wasn't until the, the rest of the British groups uh, started making some noise here that it became uh, what we perceived as a movement, you know, or an invasion. But uh, back to the, so what I was saying is that, so at in January, February of 64, I think it was still January, the record that I really you know, really wanted, and my parents didn't have a ton of money, so it was like, okay, we can get you two or three 45s a month, maybe a couple albums a year, eh, 10 albums a year. So I had to make my choices very carefully as to which records I would get, right? And the, I had just, I think the last, one of the last big records of 63 that I got was Fools Rush In by Ricky Nelson. But I was crazy about Forget Him by Bobby Rydell. Okay, so. I had it in my mind for weeks that I, I really want to get Forget Him by Bobby Rydell, which is still a huge favorite of mine. And so my mom, I'll never forget, my mom took me to the record store in Passaic, New Jersey on Market Street. And uh, with the sole uh, intent of getting Forget Him by Bobby Rydell. Meanwhile, I love the Beatles and uh, I wanted I Want to Hold Your Hand too. I had not seen a photo of them yet. So we walk up to the record store, and I don't know if you remember back then, in the, the glass door of mom and pop shops, they would have the top 20 actual 45s scotch taped to the window of the door. So as you walk in, you can see the 45s. Some had picture sleeves, some didn't. So um, we're walking up to the store, and I'm, I'm gonna get forget them today by Bobby Rydell. Wow, can't wait. And walk up to the, the door, and there's the picture sleeve to I Want to Hold Your Hand, Scotch Tape there. And I'll never forget that feeling of discovery, <laughs> seeing what they looked like. Because you know how your mind develops a, a certain image of, of people or, or, or artists before you hear them, especially back then. When you had to wait sometimes a, weeks or months to, to get a magazine or see them on TV. And 
develop a certain image of what they might look like. And there it was, that famous black and white photo of Paul with a cigarette, you know, and George leaning over. And it just startled me in a way. I was like, I, 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 I. And <laughs> so we'd go tell, uh, we'd tell the clerk, oh yeah, I want to get to, want to get Forget Him by Bobby Rydell. So he pulls the rack. I said, Mom, can't, can't we get a one to hold your hand too? And the, I remember the clerk said, oh, why, why don't you buy him two records today? And my mom just <laughs> wouldn't do it. But we got a hold, I want to hold your hand a couple of weeks, a week later or so. But uh, so that was, that was a big, big uh, revelatory moment for me was seeing that picture sleeve. So I want to hold your hand. But I walked out with, with Forget Him. And, you know, I met Bobby a few times, and I, I, I actually told him that story as if he really cared, but I, I had to share it with him. And he, and he told me, Forget Him was recorded in England, actually. Oh. Uh, and it was produ written and produced by Tony Hatch, who did Bill Clark and The Searchers and so many other great records. He told me an ex he shared an experience about um, meeting the Beatles or doing a show with them on the same bill. And he says, and you know what? I didn't think to get a picture taken with him. <laughs> wow. Well, I mean, when the beat, when my brother told me that, that they're from England, I don't even, even knew, know if I knew what England was at the time. <laughs> and, I mean, I had some semblance of the news, I guess. There, there had been a lot going on in the early 60s, and I was watching a lot of TV. We had come off the Kennedy assassination. That, that was something that's still very burned into my consciousness. So I, you know, I was aware of the world, but I guess I knew what England was, but it, it wasn't until that happened that I think we all very quickly learned what England was. <laughs> yeah, 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 wow. You know, the Dave Clark Five, I guess, were the next band that's really uh, made a huge impression on us. And there was, you know, the, there was those magazines, the Beatles versus the Dave Clark Five. But, yeah. uh, but there, was, there was a markedly different sound. And um, it was the beat, the beat, the beat, I think, you know? Uh, is what it was. It, it was a different groove. And uh, to some degree, I think we have to tip our hats to the great session drummer, Bobby Graham, who quote unquote purportedly drummed on quite a few of the Dave Clark Five records, yeah. uh, played on the early kink sides. Mm -hmm. and I, I really think that Bobby, uh, and of course he played on quite a few other records, including the Dusty Springfield record I referred to before. I think it was his, um, his feel that helped define swinging London and, and at least the, the, the direction of the British, the feel of the British invasion. And Ringo too, of course. And Ringo really was such a fabulous drummer. And, and I think he, ins he inspired other players too. When did you get your first drum kit? And was that the sound that you were, you were kind of instinctively going for? What, what exactly was going on there when you started playing? And did you take lessons? No, I never, I never took any lessons. Um, my first drum kit in 68. But like I said, uh, it was um, a p between the early 60s and 68, I had been playing along on coffee cans. All my neighbors and aunts and uncles would save the plastic lids that came with coffee cans because I would eventually break them. You know? So but I, I had, and I had a little can of marbles to like uh, emulate a snare rattle <laughs> that I would wow. put next to the coffee. You know, when I think about it, there, there was another session drummer that uh, named Buddy Saltzman, New York session guy, he played on a lot of the girl group records and um, and Four Seasons records. He was the main guy on the Four Seasons records. And I cite him and Hal Blaine, of course, as probably the, the, my early influences, uh, more pointed influences, I guess you would say, that I, I, I subconsciously tried to emulate. And then, of course, that British big beat. Uh, but Buddy Saltzman, as I look back and learn more about him, he had an unorthodox way of doing fills. And um, I got to interview him once and I said, Buddy, what, like on Ronnie by the Four Seasons, for example, there, as it fades out, there, it sounds like he's hitting a punching bag. Like, boom, boom, boom. I said, Buddy, what made you play like that? And he started talking about what it was like to be a session player in New York and dealing with all the pressures and going from one studio to another and have taxis running off with your gear and producers always wanting something. To, he said, I think it was madness. 
Uh. Was it natural to you? The drumming, yeah, came natural to me uh, at a very young age, it seems. Uh, I was probably pretty awful when I started out. I spent a lot of time with it. That's all I did once my schoolwork was done. Yeah, I played outside a little bit. I never was into sports. I just really focused on, on playing along with records. When did you start playing with other people? 1969. How'd that happen? I had a good friend. Um, well, see, grow, growing up through the 60s, it was a dream to be in a band, you know? And, and the, 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 the real problem was finding sympathetic uh, people with, with the same tastes as I had, you know? Uh, I grew up uh, with a kid called John Hornack, who was an aspiring guitar player. And he finally got a guitar, I think in 69. So he came over to, to our house and uh, I was on drums and he was on guitar and we attempted to play a bunch of Creedence Clearwater songs together. So I gotta credit John as the first other musician I ever really played with, and that was early 69. And then in 71, well, first of all, I gotta say, I met Mike Mazaris from the, who later went to play with the Smithereens uh, when, in 1966. Wow, I didn't know Third that. Or fourth, we went to school together, but he, was, he wasn't playing bass at the time. So that didn't come, off, come together till later. But in 71, you know, I, I had just graduated eighth grade and I was looking forward to going to high school because I figured there's going to be a bunch of new kids that, and the chances are of finding somebody that could play. My criteria was if I could find a guitar player who could play I Can't Explain, then I knew I had something to work with. <laughs> so freshman year of high school, I think it was the first day, period one. So it's day one, period one, row one, seat one. Okay, there's a kid kind of like a beetle hair, hair. I said, oh, this kid looks like it might be cool, right? And keep in mind, I, I want to meet somebody, a guitarist who can play I Can't Explain by the Who. He opens up his loose leaf and plastered in, inside are color photos of the Who from Hit Parader magazine. Wow, <laughs> he's the man. <laughs> I'm wondering if this guy plays guitar. So after class, I introduce myself. Turns out, that Jimmy Babjack played guitar. Oh, <laughs> man. <laughs> How cool is that? First day in high school. And that was my, wow. and that was my, my fervent desire was to, to meet a, a, a musician. And Jimmy and I started playing together that week, but it took us years to find other players and a few years for Mike to pick up the bass. You were also buying records. You're going to school. You're yeah. playing the drums. You're playing with other people. And then somehow these old friends, these people who, you had met along the way, happened to come together, and you formed the group that really becomes your group. Yeah, you know, it's funny. Really, during high school, Jimmy and I were pining for other players that were into the same music as we were. I, I wasn't playing in many other bands because I, I couldn't... Nobody I knew was into the move, except for Jimmy and I, you know, or... Uh, Jimmy and I would play these these kind of things together, just the two of us in his garage, but we were hoping to find other players. So, and then it so happened that we were really good buddies with Mike. We were good friends. The three of us hung out a lot. So Mike studied accordion as a kid. So he had, he, Mike really had good musical grounding. And I think he saw, hey man, we're hanging out. These guys are playing. Maybe if I learn to play bass, <laughs> you know, we could have a nucleus of a band. So that's what Mike did. I think it was, mm -hmm right after high school. Uh, when did you graduate? 1975. Okay. That's when we started going to see the Kinks a lot, like 74 and 75. Remember, Jimmy and I went to both nights of uh, November 74 preservation. We went both, they played two nights at the Felt Forum and uh, next door on one of those nights, John Lennon sat in with Elton John. So we missed that, but we were so close yet so far away. I remember going to Port Authority to catch our bus home after the show that night and we saw friends of ours. Yeah, we just saw John Lennon with Elton John. I'm thinking, well, I'm going to see Elton John on Sunday at Nassau Coliseum. Maybe he'll be there then too, but... <laughs> but, but, wow. but, but that, that period, 75, when the Kings were coming around doing soap opera and schoolboys and disgrace, all those, 
we would, you know, we we go all if they were playing three nights at the Beacon, we'd be there all three nights, and that's when we started seeing the usual gang of idiots, Ira, Ira <laughs> Kaplan, and Dave Schultz, everybody. You know, we'd be oh, from Trouser Press. You know, I forgot to mention Trouser Press before too. Anyway, um, so we would go to all the shows, and then we started stalking them. You know, we'd go to the hotel and yeah. and get autographs and hang out. And uh, there was one time, and and I remember. Mick was always very giving with his time. Mick Avery would, we'd be sitting in the hotel lobby just waiting for them to get back from sound check. And uh, I would just pelt him with drum questions and he would take the time and, and talk with me. I thought that was really cool. And we we're just idolizing these guys. We can't believe our luck that we're actually able to, to spend time with them. And then, and Ray was pretty cool too. Dave was always on the go. I never really, he was nice to us, but he never had a lot of time. He was always moving and grooving somewhere. But uh, Ray would take time to chat with us. And one time, it was Mike and I, we were at the, the Warwick Hotel. It was 1975, I'm pretty sure. And uh, they had just returned from Soundcheck, I think. And we said, hey, Ray. And he's walking in, he's carrying his wardrobe or whatever. Ray, how you doing? Hey, can we buy you a drink? You know, and he says, well, I'll tell you what, I'm a, i am I gotta go to my room and I, I gotta do a few things, but why don't you wait here and I'll come down and we'll have a drink. And we're waiting and we're good. And he did, you know, a uh, half hour later, whatever, he, he emerges and we went to the bar and, and had some Heinekens together, I remember. And he chatted and, hey, Ray, you guys gonna do I Need You tonight? <laughs> and he thinks, he's trying to think of the song in his mind. Oh, it's kind of, uh, you really got me sideways. Huh? Yeah, we'll do it. But they did. But uh, <laughs> I remember that. And then Mike was at the school in Maine at the time. He's going to college, and a friend of ours that we had become really tight with, Eddie Irvin, was a fellow that we met outside the Felt Forum. It's a long story, but uh, he was he came from San Mateo, California, drove across country, uh, glommed a job at NASA in Maryland somehow, and was living there. Meanwhile, his girlfriend was living in Boston. He drove up to see the Kinks in 74 at that uh, Felt Forum show, and we connected and we became really good friends. So lo and behold, one time when he was going up to visit his girlfriend in Boston, I hitched a ride with him and Mike met up with me. He came down from Maine, we met up in Boston and we went to see the Kinks, um, that was December of 75. I think it was soap opera. Uh, two nights at the, um, the Orpheum in Boston and we had no hotel room and it was bitter cold. We were just kind of roaming the streets of, of Boston all night and ended up going to the hotel they were staying in and just crashing in the lobby on a chair. Wow. <laughs> and then running into Ray, we went to Soundcheck and they did Big Sky on Soundcheck at the Orpheum. We said, wow. We'd never heard him do that song. And, and, and somehow we got booted out of Soundcheck and on, on the way out, said, hey, Ray, you're going to do Big Sky tonight? He goes, I don't know, maybe. And they didn't do it. And so after the the show, we, we went to the hotel and we're hanging out. And Ray sees me and he just remembers us from us stalking him. He's eating a pizza. <laughs> Sorry about Big Sky. <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> These are just a couple of things that come to mind. but. Uh, that's great. They were really kind to us. And also guys like John Dalton, the bass player, and Nick Newell, who was playing horns with them. Uh, very nice chaps. You know, it was, it was a great experience. And I think it uh, somehow it, it, uh, it made us feel, uh, well, this is really going to be great when we get our band together to, to be like these Yablos, you know? Anyway, a couple things that come to mind. So, uh, so yeah, that whole 70s period was a great learning era for us. So Mike started playing bass in 75 and the three of us, when he was home from college, we just started rehearsing together and playing together. But oh, we were in search of a lead singer. We had one fella, Paul and uh, Paul um, Mulligan, and uh, he was a local chap. He sang with some other bands. We rehearsed with him, but it didn't really click. It didn't really work out. So we were back to square one. The three of Mike Jimmy and myself were still very intent on finding a singer, so we started taking ads out in the Aquarian. I don't know if we ever did in The Voice, but the Aquarian is still a New Jersey paper that had a very thriving 
musicians classified back then. It was important to use the newspapers without, you know, now it's the internet, of course, but back then you had to really be diligent with the musicians classified. So I think I, I put an ad out. I, I think I still have the ad somewhere. Looking, you know, the three of us looking for a singer. I think in the, I think I said in the, in the spirit of Eddie Cochran, Buddy Holly, Beach Boys, Beatles, whatever. Maybe the Kinks and the Who are in there too. And at the same time, Pat Denizio placed an ad for, for looking for a drummer for a cover band that he had. They were called The Like, L-I-K-E. And this was '79. Yeah, this was 79, and I answered that ad. Because the, the three of us were not really gigging out, and I really wanted to play, I figured, well, I still want to play, I still, so let me explore some other options, and maybe it would help us find some people too, which it did. So I answered the ad, and um, I spoke with Pat on the phone, this, and so we arranged for me to come down and audition, and it turned out at the time they had gone through a lot of drummers coming down and, and and playing and none of them worked out. And so Pat was even discouraged and he didn't even attend my audition, but uh, I went with the other two guys in the band and uh, I, I played a few songs with them and they were somewhat impressed to, so much that they called Pat and they said, well, I think you should hear this guy. <laughs> uh, so they arranged for another audition on a Sunday. So I played with that band for, or rehearsed with that band for about six months. and. And there was some situ there was a situation there I wasn't too crazy about, so I s announced my resignation even before any gigs. I kind of stayed in touch with with the fellow Bill and with Pat. Then it came to pass that Pat was starting to write songs, and he called on me to play on his demos, which I did. And Pat was playing all the instruments, and I was playing drums. I said, "You know what? I know a couple guys that would be really good for these songs." <laughs> And that's, so I brought in, they, he, he had a bass player actually. Uh, so I brought in Jimmy and the bass player he had, I don't think was quite right for the music. And Jimmy fit like a glove right away. So eventually I brought Mike in too. And uh, that's how the Smithereens came together in early 1980. The thing about Pat, when, we met, when, when I met him, it, we really clicked because not only were we bonding musically, but on all points of culture, movies and, and, and humor and you know, all the things we, we grew up with, Famous Monsters magazine, Soupy Sales. So um, Pat and I bonded and then the four of us really had the same experience. And we had a, a deep and abiding passion for the Abbott and Costello TV show. It was like a band of brothers. To this point, it seems like everything has moved kind of slow, but you guys met and everything clicked, and from there it kind of took off. You know what? It didn't really take off that quick. We did have some good um, activity during that time. We did very quickly put, uh, do, uh, do our first EP. We recorded in 1980, Girls About Town, a seven inch EP with four original, three original songs and a cover of Girl Don't Tell Me, the Beach Boys song. And, you know, that got reviewed in local press and fanzines and helped put us on the map a little bit. Um, yeah, that was the first record that uh, any of us are, are, were on vinyl. And um, it helped us get gigs and press and, and, and create a little bit of a profile for us. And the next real um, major step for us was doing our second EP, Beauty and Sadness which Alan Betrock produced. Yeah, I think we recorded mostly in late 82 and early 83, and it came out summer of 83 on uh, Chris Capice's uh, label, Little Ricky. Um, and that was a 12-inch, the first one was a seven-inch EP, this was a 12-inch a, a EP, and it actually got a really good review in Rolling Stone, and on the strength of all that, you know, and in between, of course, we had started branching out. We started playing um, in Ohio uh, through the, do you, Miriam, do you remember a band called The Action from yeah. Cleveland? Yeah, sure. We became friends with them and we started playing on bills with them in Cleveland and Akron. Yeah, but uh, wasn't The Action, wasn't that Michael Brookheiser's band? Yeah, that's right, yep. Yeah, yep. 
um, yeah. Lux Interior's bro younger brother. That's right. And I'm still in touch with Mike, yeah. Me so too. we started coming out of the New York, New Jersey area a little bit between our first and second EPs, right? Yeah. But working with Alan, you know, Alan Betrock was, uh, was uh, a kindred spirit, to say the least. We, we shared uh, musical sensibilities, cultural uh, sensibilities, and, uh, and he was a lot, of, a lot of fun to be around. So how did you guys hook up with Don Dixon? We, there were a lot of bands around us. There was a scene, as you might recall, and bands were getting signed, but we could not get arrested. And so we sent some demos out to everybody. And eventually, we were, we were not really thinking of packing it in, but we were getting pretty discouraged because we were getting better as a band too. And you know, it just came from Europe. Rolling Stone gave us that good review, and but it was kind of not that uh, we weren't setting the world on fire. So lo and behold, a package arrived at Enigma Records, okay, on the West Coast. Who we were a pretty, they were a pretty good independent label, but our tape and package ended up. Um, in the hands of Scott, a guy called Scott Vanderbilt, a and &R guy, and he had known our other EPs from when his days as a college DJ, so he knew our music a little bit, liked it, so he said, oh, this sounds interesting, I'll give these guys a chance. And I always say a, a big part of why we might have got signed to Enigma was because of uh, the fact that we didn't include a photo in the press kit. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if that helped or, or not, but so, so they signed us, and we we're oh, really? <laughs> wow! We signed a, a contract with them in November of '85, and it was their idea to put us together with Don Dixon, okay. um, who we did not meet until the first day we recorded in December of '85 at the record. In spring of '85, we had these five songs we wanted to record, and we booked time at the record plant. We get a call that day where it was an evening session. We get a call, guys, I'm sorry, somebody booked studio, you know, studios A and B. We're going to have to kick you upstairs to the small room. Um, all their rooms were good anyway, but we, we thought, oh, man, you know, should we wait? Should we go on with the session? Ultimately, we got on the phone with each other and said, let's just do it. Okay. So we went there and we brought our gear. We load up, we go up to the 10th floor, we set up and we record five songs. And those were the same tracks that ended up on Especially For You. I'm talking Blood and Roses, Behind the Wall of Sleep, Cigarette, Crazy Mixed Up Kid, and Alone at Midnight. We cut those five basics that night. And we finished our first drafts of them, should I say. We finished our versions of those. And those, those are the tracks we were shopping that got turned down by everybody. And we finished them or sweetened them, should I say, with, and with some overdubs and maybe some different solos or different percussion with Don Dixon and he mix, remixed them. But those were the actual tracks that ended up on Especially For You, our first album with Enigma. So those are the ones that were getting turned down by everybody. Tickles the, the cockles of my heart to, to mention that. Dennis, I seen a picture somewhere, and I was trying to find it. I couldn't locate it again. Of you guys with the Kinks backstage somewhere. Did you open for them at some point in time? Oh, so in, I think I always forget if it was 1991 or 1992. Yeah, this this was a real magical moment for us because um, we were all such huge fans. Was um, that in Boston, maybe? It was, yeah. I wish I had the article in front of me. We had we were on the bill, uh, multi-artist bill, at Boston Garden. Um, it was a benefit. I don't remember much else about it. I think WBCN, the radio station, was sponsoring it, and it was a charity benefit. I don't remember a whole lot of, about who else was playing, but I do remember that Ray and Dave were playing. They were promoting, I think at the time, the... Um, the album on Columbia. What's it called? Hatred? Or the song was Hatred, right? The song um, was Hatred, yeah. What, a, what was the name of the album? Phobia. They were just touring acoustically uh, or, or without a full band anyway. They were doing, I guess it was a promo tour. So we heard they were on the bill and um, we contacted our management and said, hey, um, 
if they need a band to play with them, uh, we would sure like to do that. <laughs> you know. Wow. So what happened was they ended up doing a whole set, uh, just the two of them, but we arranged that we would come out and back them up on uh, You Really Got Me as the final tune. So we met them at Soundcheck, we went over it, we, we did a rehearsal with them, and the plan was, and this is what happened, so they, they, there was a curtain uh, on stage with the whole drums and back line behind the curtain, right? And they would perform in front of the curtain. So it was arranged that when it got to uh, the end of their set, we would go to our instruments and be ready. And when they did Lola, right, at the sing-along bit at the end of Lola, the curtain rose and we joined them on the end of Lola. Wow. And the place went nuts. It, it was really one of those eruptive moments, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow, what a thrill. And then we did You Really Got Me With Them. And there's two reviews I have, and it just, really, they, they regarded it as one of the, the major moments of that year, rock and roll moments of that year. But yeah. the place, you could really feel it, that the rafters were shaking. It was very exciting. And for us, I think Jimmy said to Mike as we were ascending the stage, so I guess we are in the kinks for tonight. The other thing I do remember, if, if, you, if you look at, um, or listen to recordings of the Kinks playing in the 80s, even the 70s through the 90s, they would play You Really Got Me Really, like super, super fast, you know? Da -da 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 -da. I never liked that. So being the drummer, I was able to hold it back to where oh, I thought. Wow. And Ray kept turning to me, like telling me to speed it up, but I never did. <laughs> oh, man. That's bold. That's great. But it came off, you know, it really was. It, you know, if there was such a thing as magic, it happened that night on stage. Are you ready for this? Come on! Sit for the Good night! Great plan! You know, I played with Dave on a couple tours. Which we was, know that. We know I should, that. You know, I, I should say also that the um, the Smithereens, after we did that show in Boston with them, we were playing at the House of Blues sometime in the 90s, I think maybe 94. And we kind of stayed in touch with Dave and he joined us there for a, an extended encore as well. So that was a, a special moment for us too. And then it's just funny how things happen. I got this encounter Dave again in the about five years ago I guess it was and he was looking to put um well he was looking for a drummer and we got together and I did some tours with him and it was, it was fun <laughs> what I, I loved about spending time with Dave is that he, he kind of had the aura and wisdom of an old sage right mm -hmm. he, he, he's a spiritual guy but he's still a punk he really is. He's he's got that. He's he still loves Eddie Cochran, you know, and he still plays with fire and and, and attitude, and just has a, a, a great outlook. He's he, he's he's got all all the things that come with having lived for a long time, uh, and but still has the heart of a teenager and of a punk, and I, I love that about him. And I saw you with Ronnie Spector. So that, I, was, I had Ronnie Spector written down. Yeah, I did too. So I, what I was going to ask is, uh, was that who else did you back up here, you know, when you were, they needed a, a, uh, a Bobby Graham type to fill in <laughs> with some of these superstars? I know that you're uh, high on that list of calls. Oh, well, you know, what just occurred to me when you mentioned Ronnie and I'm thinking, yeah, I played with Ronnie, I played with Dave. It's really like being a kid playing with your favorite record. Yeah, yeah. no kidding. Uh, it really is. Yeah. Uh, I played with Felix Cavalieri once, of the, ra uh, the Rascals, and that was really fun. Oh, Del Shannon. Yeah, Del Shannon. Um, oh, really? We became friendly with Del, and we actually called him in to uh, sing backup on uh, Smithereen's song called The World We Know on our Green Thoughts album. <sighs> well, the Bo Brummels, yeah, playing with the Bo guys in the Bo Brummels was a real thrill. The Smithereens backed them up. In 1985, then again at Cave Stump in 2000, that was huge. I played with Joan Jett, been quite a few. Oh, I got, you know, I did a session with Tommy James a few years ago. No kidding. Yeah, and that was 
I, I like that a lot because, well, such a huge fan, he's such a guy. But what I really dug about it is he was in the studio playing guitar with the band. It wasn't just like, oh, I'm in an ISO booth doing my vocal. He was really rocking out. It was That was really a lot of fun. Those are a few that come through. There's quite a few. So Dennis, you know, we've had you for a long time here, but we got a, you know, you had a whole gigantic <laughs> career just right now that was happening. Can you boil that down for us? This like, cause you got so much press. You were on, on big time TV, touring all over the place for many years, many albums. And all during this time, you guys are the best of friends real gang of smithereens and record collecting doing all this stuff that you dreamed up when you were a kid yeah oh, did i already tell the story <laughs> can, you, can you expand on that um well <clears throat> was that it that's pretty much it you guys were great friends and that came through in your music and your performances and uh you were yeah, a very well-loved group it's everything you're saying, and it's like, uh, it's, it's, I'm sure you get this sometime too. You know, you, Miriam, you're noted for so many incredible things too. And, and when you're in the eye of the storm, it's, yeah, well, this is just what I do, right? It's my passion, it's what I do. And when you are, you know, rarely do I get recognized anywhere, but sometimes I'll get an email or somebody sends me something. It's nice. Or if we do a show, you know, we still play, you know, we still play. Um, Tragically, we lost Pat in, in 2017, but we, we were fortunate to be able to, to continue with Marshall Crenshaw and Robin Wilson, uh, Robin from the Gin Blossoms, and our fans are are into it. Um, wow. Alive, and it's still really, we're still passionate about it, and our fans are, are there for us. Yeah. So we're, it's, it's been, how many years? Um, wait a minute. It's 2021 minus 1980 is how much? How many years are we together? 41. 90, 2000. 41. 40, that's a long time. Wow. Oh, you know, a couple of years ago, we were in, inducted into the New Jersey Hall of Fame, which- Wow, um, with a lot which, of your favorites, right? Well, yeah, the Four Seasons are in there. Uh, Frank Sinatra. Uh, I think the Shirelles, I hope the Shirelles are in there. Dionne Warwick is. But you know what's, what, as of earlier this year, a friend of mine st sent me a snapshot. Now I know I've arrived because they have a picture of us at one of the New Jersey Turnpike rest stops on the wall. <laughs> <laughs> Which one? Uh, I don't know. More than one. I, I, I don't know. Because I, I haven't been there myself, but... Um, Somewhere, I guess, in the south, in the southern part of, of the state. Uh, I'm not sure. That reminds me, I'm also in the White Castle Hall of Fame, because we have a, a song called White Castle Blues, and through that, which was written by Jimmy and our friend Bob Banza, we actually got inducted into the White Castle Hall of Fame. They flew us out to Columbus. Wow. But anyway. The, that's, the, that's the highest thing that you probably have mentioned so far. Right, I agree. <laughs> oh my that gosh. was before New Jersey, White too, right? Hall of Fame. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Quite a few years, yeah. Oh, Donna just texted me. She's upstairs. She could hear me. She says the Molly Pitcher rest stop. Okay, good. Right. Oh, that's a big one, too. Yeah, big one. Tell us about uh, Denny's Den. Was this something that came up now during this COVID year? How did that all come about? When I was a kid, I wanted to be a DJ. And uh, through our friend Dave Amels, I was able to get on staff at WFMU back in the 90s. And I, I, I was doing fill-ins through the years. and. Boy, that was so much fun for me. And uh, I never really had the time or inclination to do a, a, a steady weekly show. Uh, yeah, Dave asked me, why well, we got the Rock and Soul stream. You want to, I think Ken Freeman asked me too, do you want to do a, a, a weekly show? And I, I don't know, it's a lot of work. I, this and that. I said, all right, let me try it. So I did, and it, it is an awful lot of fun. It's it's actually forcing me to go through my collection and listen to records I, I hadn't listened to in, in years or, re, or, 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 or share records that I really dig. You know what it's like by doing this. You're sharing with people. It's, it's kind of a part of why we collect too or, or, or love music so much. It's, it's no fun if you're just listening in your room by yourself. You really want to share your passion with people. and. Um, and, and 
and the reason what keeps me going is that people are really digging it and really reacting to it and uh and it, and they're saying it gives them a little lift for the to get through their day and that's uh that's that's important you know that's important to me and it's important to them and it's it's an awful lot of fun the smithereens you guys have plans to play in the future we do have some things booked for later in the summer and hopefully we'll be able to play them and book they're talking about booking a lot more, but I think everybody's being careful right now, right? Uh, so we, and we're planning to make a new record too. So hopefully right. by before the end of this year, we'll be back in the studio. And that's with both singers? Probably, yeah. yeah. Yeah, the new album will be with both Marshall and Robin singing, yep. And you maybe? Yeah, I hope so. I hope I'll sing a little bit. Jim, we'll sort that all out. Big fan of the singing drummers. Yeah, I, I know where you're coming from. <laughs> yeah. We do this because we love it, and if we're lucky enough to uh, make a career out of it or, or do it to some degree that sustains us, you know, it's um, how lucky are we in that regard? But how how um, how blessed are we that we can actually uh, share it with people and how, and then it enriches their lives in, in some way? When you say, "What was it like?" Well, it's a lot of work and a lot of being away from my wife and. But the, 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 the fact is, ultimately, and I think that it, it comes through, again, like I said, now that we're even able to continue uh, with, with Robin and with Marshall, is that um, the bottom line is we're doing what we love and we're actually, we're making people happy, which I think is important now, always was, but it, I think in this day and age, it's really crucial that people have an escape or, or people have um, something to turn to. You know, here, here's a story I, 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 I tell, and this kind of this might say it all. A couple of years ago, we were checking out of a hotel, I think in New Hampshire, and uh, the clerk at the desk, this woman, said, "Oh, you guys are in the Smithereens." She says, "Yeah, I wish I could have seen the show last night." A real good friend of mine uh, was a big fan of yours. We said, "Was yeah? Well, she passed away." She loved your music. Matter of fact, she had the lyrics from your song in a lonely place inscribed on her tombstone. Oh Ooh. my goodness. And uh, I, I can't think of a better way to uh, illustrate how far reaching uh, your music or, or what you do in life. Sometimes you, you do things in life that you don't even realize how, how they can touch people or reach people, you know, even if it's not being in the public eye or, or whatever. Yeah. Well, Dennis, thank you so much for stepping in here with the Water of the Underground crowd and filling us in with all of your adventures. We're going to keep an eye and an ear out for all the good stuff that's coming forward. Now, we got to listen in to Denny's Dan, absolutely. And we are going to be keeping an ear and an eye out for those shows that you're talking about. So let's go with all of this great stuff with the Smithereens again and with Dennis Dyken. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Miriam and Johnny. I really had a great time and I appreciate you calling me to do this. And I want to just say hi to everybody out there who has listened through the years. And um, Smithereens fans are really loyal and wonderful people and we really appreciate the fact that uh, our music has meaning for them thank you very much thanks, thanks.